Hello, my name is Tommy Chamberlain and I'm the exhibit director of the World of Jesus on display here at the Appalachian Center for the Arts in downtown Pikeville, Kentucky. We're here to September 11th and we hope you come out and join us. We have over 100 artifacts from first century Israel on display, uh, authentic 2,000 year old artifacts from the Middle East, the era of the early Roman era we may say archaeologically or maybe you're more, more familiar with the New Testament. Uh, term. You know, we're in Kentucky, so we're in the Bible Belt. We're very familiar with the Gospel stories and the New Testament. Uh, but uh, the world is 2,000 years ago. What's the culture like? What are people eating out of, drinking out of? What are their homes like? Uh, how do they dress? What's daily life like? Well, those are the sort of things we tackle in this exhibit uh, as we explore artifacts that take us from the manger to the cross uh, when we explore the Gospel story. So one of the things we look at here at the World of Jesus is everyday life and also some very famous accounts uh, from the New Testament text. And so without going all into it, uh, probably one of the most famous is one that we see every year around December, especially local churches putting on Christmas plays. The account of the birth of Jesus uh, in the book of uh, Luke and the book of Matthew. And we see Jesus born in Bethlehem in a manger. Uh, and often we, we impose our modern western mind on the story and we've got a wooden trough like we'd find in our modern barn uh, and the baby's being laid in this wooden trough or manger. But in reality in the first century that's probably not what it was. We're looking at a very good replica of a first century manger. Uh, and when we look at this, it would have been stone with the recess here where they would feed the animals. And a little common sense says if we put something soft in here, uh, this becomes a perfect cradle, crib, whatever we want to call it, as the baby can't roll out. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. So we're looking at what a typical first century manger would look like uh, from 2,000 years ago. Archaeologically, we believe this is a good chance that this is a perfect example of something that's become a pop history uh, icon. And so my hero, a guy named Indiana Jones, in one of his movies, goes after the Holy Grail. And he's looking for the cup that Jesus drank from at the Last Supper. And the, the, the movie does a real good job of explaining what the cup probably isn't. Uh, but our archaeologist says they might have should have asked an archaeologist what it probably would have been. So at a first century Passover meal, which is this is what the Last Supper is, most likely the cup served for those Jewish believers uh, to use would have been something that couldn't become impure probably a stone vessel like this one. So are we looking at an example of maybe the famous Holy Grail of history? We tend to think so. So in this display we find a few examples of Roman era jewelry and my wife's favorite are the two gold hoop earrings. So the gold hoop earring is popular in the first century and the main reason is apparently they were popular through the centuries. We don't have good stratification on these two uh, so while these may be perfectly first century what's interesting is you will see the exact same thing in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem dated to the Iron Age 3,000 years old. So we're looking at our crucifixion display here. The one item that we want to look at in the middle here is a Roman era nail. Now because of the remains found of crucifixion victims, we have a pretty good idea of what size nail Romans are using to crucify uh, those who are given the sentence of death with that punishment. And we find on a display an example of an authentic nail from the era that matches that size. Now in the text we also have a reference to Jesus of Nazareth having his uh, side pierced with a spearhead. Uh, we find a Roman era spearhead here and the soldiers cast lots for his garment. One of my favorite simple artifacts on display are the small ancient Roman dice that are very common uh, to our modern six-sided die that you might use in a Monopoly game or any other board game. In case you didn't know, we do have found examples of ones that are clearly rigged so the owner could cheat. So the artifact we're looking at here is a bronze statue from the Roman era. So let's ballpark him at 2,800, 1,800 years old of Zeus or Jupiter, or as I like to call him, the big cheese of the Roman gods. Uh, and these type of figurines are very popular at the time. Uh, someone might purchase this to keep at their home and have their own little shrine. But one of my favorite artifacts on display is this small bronze statue of the big cheese, like I said himself, Zeus or Jupiter. Uh, from the time of the Roman era 2,000 years ago. 
Thank you for your brief sample visit here to the world of Jesus. We've shown you a few things that are on display, but keep in mind, we have over 100 authentic ancient artifacts here on display and some very important replicas of other items that are in only in major museums across the world. So we hope you come out and join us. Now, we're going to be here uh, at the Appalachian Center of the Arts at least to September 11th. Maybe we'll extend it. We'll see. Uh, and we're open just to walk in on any weekday from 2 to 5. But if you want to come at a different time or you want to bring a, bring a group, a church group, school group, or even a family group, whatever, you can do that uh, by scheduling an appointment by contacting us here at the Appalachian Center for the Arts. One other really neat thing about our exhibit is our small gift shop. We've got a small bookstore with books you're, you're not going to find on the regular bookshelf, a widow's mite, an ancient coin necklace, or necklaces with Roman ancient glass. Uh, kids books, uh, replica oil lamps, just things that are really neat. We hope you come out and join us uh, and take experience of this unique opportunity here in Eastern Kentucky to experience the ancient world and the world of Jesus, first century Judea and Israel, right here in Pikeville, Kentucky. Ladies and gentlemen, the exhibit director from the World of Jesus up at the Appalachian Center for the Arts in downtown Pikeville, Kentucky, Mr. Tommy Chamberlain. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, and it's good to be here. It's good to have you up here. Uh, I got a chance to go visit the World of Jesus exhibit just a few weeks ago, and I, you blew my mind with a lot of the stuff that you have up there. And for uh, the people that want to go check it out, y'all are going to be up there for quite a while. And uh, ex kind of explain to people what exactly the World of Jesus exhibit is. Sure. Well, uh, since you mentioned we're going to be there for a while, we're going to be there to at least September 11th. So folks have got some time. But what is it? Why, why should they come out and see it, right? Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's something pretty rare for our part of the world in eastern Kentucky. Uh, it's an archaeological exhibit of artifacts, about 100 of them, dating back 2,000 years. Uh, these artifacts come from around the time of the first century, uh, the time of... Uh, if you want to put a biblical reference to it, the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the time of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And we're looking at material culture. In other words, what did people eat out of, drink out of? What did they cook with? Uh, what things were they seeing and using in their everyday lives? That's what this is all about. Uh, and usually to see things like this, you would have to go to a large metro area. From our area, at least like Cincinnati or uh Atlanta, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. I know I've driven to Atlanta to see a large archaeology exhibit before. So we think this is pretty unique for Eastern Kentucky. Yeah, it's so neat because people that are into, if you're just a history nerd or into archaeology or even just into the, if you're religious and you can't afford to go to places like Jerusalem or like you say, go to these uh, big cities like Atlanta or Chicago mm -hmm. or New York where there's a lot of these museums at, to have something like this right here in our backyard, we are so fortunate. And it, I mean, it really is a great exhibit. Uh, kind of explain to some of the people what some of the artifacts up there are, because you have quite a few cool ones. Yeah, we do. We have uh, a lot of things to see. And, you know, each person may have their personal favorite. But among my favorites, one of my favorite is a uh, we have a stone vessel mug. Mm -hmm. OK, so it's a stone cup. So why is that cool? Well, that particular artifact comes from a site called Kermit L. McCotter, which may well be a site visited by Jesus of Nazareth himself and his disciples. It's mentioned in the book of John. We believe it's the place called Ephraim. So that makes it cool. But when we look at this artifact uh, and we know the archaeology of those sort of things, this type of cup is being used for a real short period of history, which just happens to be that uh, life of Jesus, New Testament era, and for those that love a little uh, pop history, uh, uh, or maybe uh, my hero, a guy named Indiana Jones, if you like those movies, and he goes yeah. chasing after the Holy Grail, you know, the cup that Jesus passes at the Last Supper. We I think there's pretty good reason to believe it's this type of stone vessel. And we've got one on display right here in eastern Kentucky. So that's one of my favorites. And I could there's many more to talk about. So, so, so why so. but why do you think that uh, this type of mug or vessel would be the Holy Grail? Well, uh, what happens in this period of history is we find that Jewish believers are becoming, and we use the word obsessed, and we don't think that's too strong, obsessed with ritual purity. Uh, and they're doing it. We're showing up in a lot of different ways in their lives and ways we can find in the archaeological record. 
Uh, they are bathing in mikvah or mikvah oat uh, mm-hmm. daily. Uh, in in you know in modern Western, you're like, so so what? We're getting a bath daily. Well, that's not what this is for. They're not bathing with soap and to get clean. It's a ritual thing. This is all about being right with God and uh, being holy. Uh, and so they're doing these things, uh, things that are seen as very pagan, pottery with uh, uh, with images on it are shunned. While it still exists all around their area and their part mm-hmm. of the world, they're using very plain things. And one of the other examples are these stone vessels. And there are ver- verses in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, that reflect that God says to the Hebrew people that once your pottery becomes impure, you must break it, says the Lord. Mm-hmm. Well, we find that pottery, wood, metal, different things can become impure. But in the 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 uh, human mind's way of dealing with things, there's nothing there about stone becoming impure. So let's oh. make our plates, let's make our cups out of stone, uh, and uh, then we don't have to replace them. <laughs> and ah. so, and, and you know, while that sounds really strange, uh, the Jerusalem area white limestone, if you've ever handled one of these mugs or plates, it's not as heavy as you would expect. So mm-hmm. while it may be heavier than our glass mug, it's still very usable. Uh, and therefore, if it's a ritual purity concern, this famous Last Supper uh, was a uh, Passover meal, which is a, obviously a very important meal to a Jewish believer. Uh, and so the host of that home would have never let that rabbi and his followers be using vessels mm-hmm. that could have been impure. So it's a most likely type situation. Yeah. Most likely what we know from the material culture at the time is they're probably using these stone vessels. So therefore... It kind of makes sense that famous Holy Grail is probably one of these stone cups. I wonder where the story comes from then, like the the story that everybody knows mm-hmm. of, like the Indiana Jones movie, where it's this gold cup, almost looks like a pimp cup. I, how did that come about? Well, it, 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 that's a neat history story. It's really a medieval story. Hmm. So it, it, the truth of the Holy Grail is probably, you know, no one when those events happened would have seen that as something to save or of importance. I always tell people the truth is it's it's in a garbage dump in Jerusalem. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's what happened to it. You know, but in the medieval period when uh, Christianity is is the the only religion of Western Europe, relics become very popular. So they're hunting for pieces of the true cross, mm. uh, the thorns from Jesus' crown, things that would never have been saved or preserved. But in their mind, they get these things and they become relics in the churches all through Europe. Well, at this time, the Holy Grail, the cup from that Last Supper, also becomes popular. Uh, mm. You know, there is much modern pop history uh uh, kind of conjecture linking this to the Knights Templar. Yeah. You know, if you love history and you love uh, uh, conspiracy history, you know, the Knights Templar are a real popular name. So it, it's in that period that the Holy Grail, you know, this cup from the Last Supper becomes famous or interesting. Uh, and so that's where we get this gold or silver chalice. And of course, the Indiana Jones movie did a good job yeah. explaining that's probably not what it is. Uh, the uh, But that's when we, where we get that. One of the cool things that I learned whenever I went and visited your exhibit up there is the uh, manger exhibit that you showed me, because that, that's another thing that a lot of our uh, Western minds like to think of as, oh, Jesus was born in a manger. It's this wooden crate with a bunch of hay inside mm-hmm. of it. But you kind of blew my mind when you were explaining to me what a manger back then actually was. Yep. And so one of the things that happened when we read any ancient text, and specifically the Bible, uh, in our culture, we tend to to do what's natural. We put ourselves in with what we know, mm-hmm. and so we very much think of the Christmas account, and and we have this manger. We read the account, and we've got the story taking place in a barn out back with this wooden manger, which is exactly what we would expect in our culture from what we read in the text. Now, in reality, in that time, uh, there was no barn out back. That would have mm-hmm. been as foreign. Uh, to them is what they did is to us, which is they actually kept those animals in the house at night. Mm. Now, I can't imagine that smell. Yeah, that'd, ooh, that'd be a little bit rough. <laughs> that would be a little rough. But in a world where your donkey, your ox, uh, that these animals uh, are your livelihood, and if something yeah. happens to them, your family may starve. There is no welfare. There is no safety net. They are too important to put them away somewhere where you cannot keep them safe at night. Mm -hmm. So what we know from the archaeology is these animals 
were kept basically on the first floor of your home. Uh, if you built most of these homes in, in Israel are built in hillsides, so you would make use often of a natural cave, and you would build a wall in front of that. And uh, the term is a fenestrated wall, which is a fancy term to mean a wall with big windows in it. Yeah. Uh, in that way, you can have the animals on the inside, and from your courtyard outside, you can feed and water and take care of them. Well, what do you set in those big window sills? Well, this is where the manger goes. And those mangers were heavy stone items. Mm-hmm. with, uh, for lack of a better term, a cutout in the middle uh, where you would put the food and the water. And if you read the text carefully and you realize uh, what a manger is, it makes perfect sense to a baby born in that environment. Uh, you put something soft in it, and it's a perfect c- crib or cradle. The baby can't roll yeah. out. Uh, and so uh, it makes sense. But it, you know, it, it gives us the idea of understanding a world that was very different than ours 2,000 years ago. Yeah, it, it was very different, but also very similar as well. That was one thing that I kind of was catching on to as I was walking around the exhibit because I was seeing all types of these artifacts that we still have today. For example, the uh, the six-sided dice, I thought mm-hmm. that was so cool. I'm like, I, di- I didn't know they were playing Scrabble back then. I had no idea. And uh, the, the jewelry exhibit, how you were talking about the gold earrings mm-hmm. and stuff like that, we oftentimes think about like, oh, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, that was almost cavemen, you know? But no, these yeah. were actually like very progressed civil people. Mm-hmm. So the, the earrings are probably my wife's favorite artifacts in the whole exhibit. They're these gold hoop earrings that could very easily uh, be mistaken for something a lady might buy today. Yeah, they're very, they're, they're beautiful. They're very Great beautiful, mo- modern looking, uh, and yet they're 2,000, 3,000 years old. And, uh, you know, one of the things about human nature, uh, whenever we live in history, uh, you know, especially if we are... Uh, in a society where we have some affluence, mm-hmm. we have some ability, some wealth, or some some way to to be beyond just the ability to live and eat daily, uh, we want to look our best. Yeah, and that's you know, if you ever do a study on the Roman lady, you know, those ladies knew how to look their best, <laughs> and they yeah. had the jewelry and the makeup and the beautiful attire, and so and the hairstyles to go with it. So are most of the artifacts up at the World of Jesus exhibit mostly from the shallow area? Well, no, they are from uh, Israel and if maybe a few from Jordan. Okay. So, but not not necessarily from the uh, shallow area where I excavate. Okay. So all, okay. all across the country, and 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 the way that is is most of them come on loan from a couple museums. Okay. So so what is one of your favorite artifacts up there? Let's see. Uh, I mentioned the cup already. Uh, That's always been one of my favorites, but probably my favorite right now, just because of the rarity uh, and that we were privileged to have it on display for the first location ever, we have uh, part of a one-ton boulder that has been cut away. So we have much a smaller portion of it. And the portion we cut away has etching on it. Mm. And a volunteer found it in the next to last season at this site called Kerbet El Makader, uh, And they weren't sure what it was. And then the next year, the architect, in the final season, they're putting all the plans and all the work together. We've got it all done. So what did this ancient village, town, city look like? And he put it together, and he did the city layout with the city walls and all that. And he immediately says, oh, my gosh, I've seen this before. And it was the etching on the boulder. It is a map from 2,000 years ago. Now, was it someone laying out the city? Or was it a kid outside, bored that day and taking his knife and carving out, you know, what he sees before him? We don't know. Yeah. Uh, But it was an accurate layout of the city from 2,000 years ago. And and to our knowledge, uh, there's nothing else like that ever been found in ancient Israel. And we get to put it on display here first, anywhere. Uh, And I always joke, uh, I always like to tell the story, the head archaeologist from the site when he agreed to put it on loan, did advise me that if something happened to it, my life was considered forfeit. So, and I chuckled like we just did, but he did not. Hey, <laughs> so. I, I, I do not blame him. I mean, this is very serious stuff that you're talking about, especially in the area that y'all are digging in. I mean, whenever we're thinking about ancient civilizations, a lot of us that are history buffs, we like to think of the Mayans or the Incas or yep. Tepe. but I mean, this is the actual holy land mm-hmm. that y'all are digging in. What I watched a, a little video that that you were featured in here earlier, and I was watching y'all digging, and I, I was getting anxious as I was watching you dig because do, do you ever get scared that you might break something, or uh, how do you go about 
the process of digging? And how do you do it the most careful way possible? And, and you just said it right. You, you kind of do it the most careful way possible. But the reality is, once you've got a little experience, you realize that it's all already broken. <laughs> or 99% <laughs> okay. of it. Uh, and so we find 2,000 pieces of broken pottery a day. Pottery shirts. Uh, and so you find that. But the reality is, as you're, you're working, you carefully move down. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're not bringing a backhoe in and removing large areas of dirt at one time. Uh, you're carefully moving down and moving as much soil as you can in a day. But then if you come down upon something uh, that appears more fragile or, or, or more important, then you slow down. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you're already not going necessarily fast. Yeah, I uh, but uh, so and it depends what you're finding. And you know, obviously, if you're going through a layer that doesn't have as much, you can dig a little faster and use a little better equipment. But so. yeah, it, it's uh, really neat to watch the whole process around it. And I mean, it's a heck of a lot of work, but so rewarding. Mm-hmm. What, what's one of the coolest things, in your opinion, that you've found while actually out on an archaeological dig? Well, our team has found lots of really cool things, but to make it on a personal level, the, the favorite thing I've personally ever found was the majority of what we call a, a large pithos. Uh, imagine a storage jar from the floor up to your chest. Big, mm-hmm. big, huge storage jar. And we're digging uh, at the site of Shiloh, and we're digging, and in the square I'm working that year, we have found the city wall. So literally, you think of the ancient cities with the big fortification defensive walls. So I'm digging three feet from that. Yeah. That we've re- I've already helped uncover that, so that's awesome. And then on the next to last day, I find the top of this large storage vessel, and we expect to maybe find storage rooms. Uh, this is a place of sacrifice. So mm. normally you'd find houses, but at Shiloh, are we going to find storage rooms? Uh, and, and I find what ends up to be the majority of this large storage jar that predates even the Israelites. Uh, it's Canaanite or Amorite, dating to about 1600 B.C., 3,600 years ago. Wow. Uh, and so this is something that people were using in everyday life. So in effect, I'm touching a life 3,600 years ago, in a sense, as I dig this out of the ground. And uh, for me, that, you know, that large one, large pottery vessel, yeah. that was a, an amazing experience. And it was my first season. So, you oh, know, that, wow. that, that, that gets you hooked. Yeah, that's <laughs> a mean, heck you know, of a way to kick it so, off. Well, yep. I was going to ask, how long have you been doing this for? And and how did you get started, too? Like, how does somebody get started sure. doing this? Well, you know, I've loved archaeology since probably I was a teenager. But I always, I would describe my, my interest as a fan. It was like something that maybe someday when I retire from my Real job, you know, that I'll, yeah. I'll go on a dig in my 70s or something. And it just didn't seem from, from eastern Kentucky and our part of the world, it just didn't seem like a tangible, you know, uh, something to pursue. Well, but it was something that I always read. You know, I would read books, magazines, mm-hmm. TV shows, and just loved it and knew a lot about, but didn't see a way for me to become involved. Yeah. Well, several years ago, I was the alumni president at the University of Pikeville. And one of the archaeology associations I was a member of advertised that they had artifacts from their site in Israel uh, that were approved by the Israeli government to go on tour in the U.S., and they were touring, and they were looking for universities in the United States to host this archaeological exhibit. When my role as the alumni president, I wrote saying, how about the University of Pikeville in Pikeville, Kentucky? I expected a swift no, but you can't get a yes if you don't ask a question. Exactly. Uh, and the response was, we're not sure. Tell us Ooh. why we should come there. So it wasn't no. And I basically said, hey, here's what we're going to do in Pikeville. Uh, you know, the artifacts are not just going to be in small, uh, you know, stuck away in curio cabinets. We're going to do banners and all this stuff so people understand the history of what they're seeing. And I also explained why that would be important to this region, that this would be something that normally doesn't happen here and it would be, you know, of, of great interest here. Uh, and they said yes. Well, mm. by working on the exhibit, I had to get to know the head archaeologist of the site. And I always joke, and I'm not sure that he meant it this way, but this is the way it happened. He at one point told me I was going on his excavation the next summer. I don't recall being asked. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I, I would just go with so, it. Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't like, ask any questions. I'm like, well, I, didn't, I just I got to go. I say to the wife, you know, and uh, so I went. And at that point, wasn't sure, you know. Uh, is this a once in a lifetime thing? Well, I went and uh, fell in love with it, you know, yeah. and just just loved it. And at that point, you know, uh, I said, uh, this is something I want to do every summer for the rest of my life. 
What so. What's the feeling like whenever you're standing on top of ancient ruins from biblical days? I would say that that's a feeling that you can't explain to anybody. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that you just... Uh, you think of the texts and the stories from a biblical text, and then when you're standing there connected to the history, uh, it brings that to life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it brings it to, you know, life in a way that's hard to really explain. I would use the word tangible. As -hmm. you're literally digging up the pieces, the remains of these lives from that period of history. Uh, And, you know, it's a lot of hard work. But I, you know, but then when you find something, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to find lots of somethings. We've so much party. But when you find something and you think this may be important or or this is different, you know, all that hard work disappears with the adrenaline. You know, yeah. and it, uh, it, it it's it's an amazing experience. And you never know what it's going to be either. No. Like uh, just a few days ago, I was watching this little documentary about Gobekli Tepe mm-hmm. and uh, how they thought. I think they thought that it was like this uh, funeral, uh, not a funeral, but like, basically like a graveyard right. at one time at the Potbelly Hill. And uh, I forget the archaeologist's name at the time, but he noticed uh, the ground it had. He could tell that there was more to it. Yep. And then they started digging, and now it's the oldest known site known to man. I mean, because yep. you, you, you never know what you're going to find on these digs. And I didn't know this was a thing either, but people that, like you or me, that are interested in stuff like this, and like you were before, and just didn't know how to be a part of this, you actually bring people from the area, if they want to go on an archaeological dig, they can. Yep. And, and that's one of the things that's so neat is we, uh, we allow volunteers. You know, and people always say, well, you know, I, I don't have any training. I can't do that. Well, that's okay. We'll train you. You know, that's mm-hmm. the uh, – uh, or, or I've always had some folks that say, I would love to do that, but I'm too old. And, and our head archaeologist says, I love senior volunteers because they're already accustomed to pain and suffering. And so, <laughs> so, you know, and uh, – but That's uh, good. That's good. But we take volunteers, anything from – you know, we have young teenagers come with their families, you know, lots of college kids up to seniors who retired and anybody in between. And we train you on the site. Uh, and uh, so the, the neat thing about those volunteers, those people who are coming and digging for the first time is they're getting to do the digging. And a guy like me who's been there, done that. Well, I'm, I'm on staff, so I'm actually writing everything down. So who's making the discoveries? It's the new guy or the yeah. new gal. They're literally the ones digging up history while we're just having to sit there and write down what they're doing and say, here's how you do it. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, to see a volunteer, one of my favorite stories uh, from our excavation, we had a gentleman, and I wish I, I need to find out his exact age because I've forgotten now, but he was like 85 or 90, way up there. Obviously, he couldn't be down on his hands and knees and do the digging, but he did our wet sifting. And one of our processes is once we've removed the soil and we sift it and dry sift it, we take it and wash it because we discovered that so much you're missing. When you see a million little dirt clods a day, well, an ancient Egyptian scarab covered in dirt looks like another dirt clod. Yeah. Well, we're washing that out. And the, the old man gets excited and he starts shouting, Woo! you know, well, what, what? and he pulls out a scarab. Uh, and I can't remember it, maybe I don't remember exactly who, but just for the sake of argument uh, from the reign of Tutmosis the third, you know, a famous Egyptian pharaoh. You know, no, he didn't oh. know that when he pulled it. He just knows he's got an ancient Egyptian scarab. And you imagine the excitement, you know, here's something wow. no one's touched from ancient Egypt in 3,000 years, 3,500 years, and here he is, you know, 90 years young, yeah. uh, and, and he's the man who finds it. Wow. And so that's the kind of experience that you just, you know, uh, uh, that's what sells people. That's that's yeah. that's why you go, uh, you know, we can never predict. Like you said, you don't know what you'll find. Uh, but to be, to have that experience uh, and to literally, literally uh, dig ancient history, as our director says, literally dig the Bible, you know, uh, it, that's just hard to beat. And, and it's so cool that y'all are in Shiloh, too. Do you, do you say Shiloh or Shalom? Well, uh, it depends who we're talking to. Yeah, if you're so here, if I'm you're here, here, I say Shiloh, because uh, people here won't know what Tel Shiloh is. Yeah. Uh, if you're in Israel, you say Shiloh. So, yeah, because yeah. I've been watching some videos getting ready for this podcast, and I've if I watch five different videos, people pronounce it five different ways. Exactly. 
But it, it's so cool because uh, this is the town of the original Ark of the Covenant. That's correct? right. So when we talk about pop history, you go back to our, my guy, Indiana Jones, and that first movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. He's looking for the Ark. So we're actually digging in a site where the biblical text says the Ark sat for 300 years. Uh, and you know, and I've thought of that a few times. If the if the if the tabernacle, which is where the ark is housed, if it's on the summit or somewhere close there too, I'm literally you know within 20 feet of where this thing would have sat. Is where I'm digging, and wow. you know, so that's just when you think about what was here before and the text, and you have famous names associated like Joshua and Samuel. Uh, that that that. Is amazing when you think about the site, where, yeah. where, you know the history there. That's the site where I died at. Actually, I fell back in the chair. Yeah, hey, Eli. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. He got the bad news. The old priest, and uh, he was sitting in the gate, uh, and that's one of the fascinating things. So you read the text, and then we actually we're not sure yet. We have to do a little more excavation. We may have found the gate. Uh, wow. Or a postern gate, at least a secondary gate. So is that the gate Eli sitting at when the word comes? Maybe we don't know. Wow. But still, that's, that's a neat, neat. Yeah, that's a neat, <laughs> neat thing to, to link, make that link. Yeah, because I, I was wondering how they actually knew if y'all were at the correct location. But then I watched a video where they were taking the measurements from the Bible mm-hmm. and where they measured the walls. It's exactly. Mm-hmm. So I mean that the Bible, whether you know people are religious or not, it's one of the most accurate history books that we really have to hold on to nowadays. That's right. And it's an interesting thing about the text. Whether whether you're a person of faith or not, you can take a look at the history and see how, if you look at it impartially, how the history and what's interesting areas of it that were criticized 100 years ago as fairy tales, we now know because of archaeology, the writer knew exactly what he was talking about yeah. when he's talking about the Amorites, the Hittites, people like this. And we find uh, uh, an amazing correlation with history. Yeah, it's, it's such an amazing site. So whenever you're out there on these archaeological digs, I would say that it gets pretty hot. What? For, <laughs> I know you explained this to me uh, last time, but I'm going to ask a lot of the same questions sure. on this podcast here. What do you dress up in as? Because me, I'd like to have a tank top and ball shorts, to be honest, but I'm sure that's not what archaeologists sure. are wearing out there well, on the job. Well, in reality, we let, uh, we, we let people dress comfortably. Uh, you re- recognize the weather's going to get warm, so we want you to be comfortable. Uh, we do have uh, a few suggestions for ladies, and you know you have to recognize you're in a different part of the world mm-hmm. with different customs. So, uh, so uh, we we do look at this, but in general, people can wear a t-shirt and shorts, uh, yes. and uh, uh, it'd be very comfortable. Obviously, you're working hard; you're going to be sweating. Uh, you want to, you know, uh, be. Uh, be as comfortable as you can, but one of the ways we battle that heat is we get up really early. So r- rise and shine on archaeology digs about 4 a.m. Uh, and uh, and we're on the bus. We actually stay in East Jerusalem, uh, and then we travel to our site daily by bus. It's about a 45-minute drive, and we're on the bus by 4.59. I don't know why we say 5, but we 4.59, <laughs> uh, and we're on the site digging by 6 a.m. Uh, wow. and setting up. Uh, and so you start early, and in the morning it's cool, and you're watching the sun come up, coming up over uh, the uh, the uh, the mountains there. Uh, it's a beautiful sight, uh, and then we put up shade tents over our mm-hmm. squares, and then you know by midday it's starting to get hot, and by the time it gets really hot, we pack it up and we head out. And we go back to our hotel with the air conditioning and on the bus with the air conditioning. <laughs> I, so. I, yeah, I do not blame you one bit. For the people that want to uh, volunteer to go on any of these trips with y'all, how do mm-hmm. they go about doing that? Well, officially, they can sign up at digshiloh.org, mm-hmm. digshiloh.org. Uh, but what the, one of the biggest challenges for me years ago is it's something I have always have loved to do, but it was like the, the intimidation might be the right word of, Packing up by myself and going that far away to a to a country a uh, country in the Middle East where I know no one yeah, you don't that was speak just the language yeah, you, you know so that seems so difficult and what I always tell folks in our community is if this is something you want to do and you want to go uh, then go with me and you can you can book the same plane I'm going to be on and you can fly over with me and I'll effectively hold your hand till we get to the hotel uh, and you know uh, I try, I take students from the university when students are able to travel uh, and so uh, it's a situation where uh, you know 
if they want to go, you know, they 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 can go on their own. But if they if there's that just you know, I just don't know about doing it by myself. Then come with me. I'm happy yeah. to have you go, and and you can be part of my square, and we'll we'll uncover history. Then we'll send you on a tour so you can uh, explore some of it on your own too. Your your second week there. It's so neat that us hillbillies have this in, uh, incredible of an opportunity. Uh, it's. I know that some people out there don't get it. I have some friends that I'll try to talk to about something like this, and they just don't get it. But whenever whenever I was up there at the uh, World of Jesus uh-huh. exhibit, and you're getting to hold these pieces of clay pottery yeah. that are close to 3,000 years old or these coins or anything, your mind just races. Yeah. I mean, you're just wondering, who held this? Where did it come from? Why did they drop it? Why didn't they pick it up? It's... Your mind just wonders. Well, what, what I would always say to people, and maybe their thing is not archaeology, but I always tell people that we, each of us, should be involved in something bigger than yourself. Mm. Whatever that is, whatever mm. your passion, find, find a passion in life and go do it. Maybe mm. it's not your job. Hopefully it is. Uh, but something to be involved in where you add something positive to society that beyond yourself, something bigger than you, something where maybe your name will probably never be the, 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 the name on the book or whatever, but yeah. some, and maybe it will, but something, something you're passionate would love to do. And for me, if, if a person loves history, archaeology, or the biblical text, this makes perfect sense. Uh, even if you're not a, gosh, I'm not like Tommy, I don't think I'd want to do that every year. Imagine the once in a lifetime experience, and that's exactly. most of our volunteers. It is a lifetime experience, something they'll be proud of, and say, "I was part of that for the rest of their life." And you know, uh, so for folks listening, if that's something they'd be interested in, we'd love to have them be part of what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, because you never know what you're going to find. I mean, the the people, I'm sure that the people that were on the very first dig in shallow i mean they were literally making history Mm -hmm. as they were discovering what they were at one time it was just i'm not sure really what it was but i'm sure it was just a pile of sand it's you can rewrite history you never know what's going to happen on these archaeological digs that's right and that's the beautiful thing you don't know yeah we do not know what's beneath the soul we can speculate all we want but until you dig you don't know what's there uh and uh the, the good part with those that are educated in the craft, you can look around and you can get some speculation as to buildings and things of that nature. But, uh, you know, for example, the area where we're digging, do we keep digging and we find a library, you know, writings mm-hmm. from 3,000 years ago? Well, you know, immediately that'd be one of the most important discoveries in the archaeological text from a famous biblical site. But... Yeah. Maybe not, you know, <laughs> you, you just don't. And that's the excitement of it. What's there waiting? And you can be a part of digging that up. So I know you mentioned earlier about you find so many of these uh, pieces of clay pottery and just these other things that some somebody like you're just your average everyday Joe like me would lose our minds over. These archaeologists mm-hmm. that have been at it for years, they can just push it to the side. What do you do with those pieces that you push to the side? Well, we find, like I said, about 2,000 pieces a day, and I know this is going to sound really strange. We throw about 90% of them away. Wow. <laughs> and in the reality, it deals with reality. You know, How many jars can you have? Yeah, you know? exactly. How much? Now, if we find anything intact, anything that is scientifically important, uh, anything that generally we can repair, we have all the pieces in repair, we're certainly keeping that. But it's for scientific studies... You know, maybe the way to think of it is, do we really need 20 pieces of the same type of vessel? Uh, And the idea is to find the stuff that gives us the most information, the pieces that are most identifying of certain time periods that can tell us in this level. So that's what the pottery is really valuable for is dating. Mm -hmm. It's like a car guy. A car guy, you know, I can look at a car and I know, well, is it 60s, 70s, as opposed to today? But a real car guy can say, that's a 1967 Corvette with a blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, that's what the pottery guy does. The pottery guy can say, this piece of pottery dates to this period in history within sometimes a 50 or 100 year range. And then that tells us what the date is of the other stuff. So that 10% we're saving. Now, the 90%. 
uh, we throw it in a pile. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's, yeah, I hate to say it, it's a horrible term, it, it's it's trash. It's uh-huh. invaluable history, but it's trash. Uh, but I personally always get a little bit of that because I love to use it for educational purposes because when I speak to schools or church groups or just visitors to our exhibit, to be able to put something like that in their hand and say, now you saw a 2,000-year-old cook pot upstairs, and you saw what it looked like. Look at this piece, and you see the light come on. They're like, yeah. I can tell that this is a piece of that. And I'm like, that's what the archaeologist does, and what you're holding is 2,000 years old. That's just a neat educational experience mm-hmm. we couldn't provide otherwise without the the tangible. I believe you know, we talk about hearing history or watching history. I believe there's a bit of excitement in the holding history yeah. and the motivation it helps us to learn. So the uh, volunteers, do they get to keep anything that they find, or do they mostly have to turn it in at the end of the day? They have to turn it in. Okay. Everything is turned over, and all is property of the Israeli government or the Israeli people. Uh, and so everything we find is turned over uh and uh, goes into storage. And, and, you know, I would like to think that with the group we work with, that someday I can make an announcement that we're getting to display 50 items from Shiloh here in eastern Kentucky, yeah. you know, on loan. Uh, but at the end of the day, those things return return home to where they came from. Well, so. if people just don't understand how long it takes to dig. Even I was very unaware until just a few years ago. I was watching a video uh, earlier about one of the shallow digs, mm-hmm. and it said it took them about two weeks just to not even go half a body length in the ground. Yeah. It's uh, It takes quite a while, especially when you're trying to be as careful yep. as you are. Yep. And so it, all, it depends how deep you're digging. You obviously are moving very carefully how hard the soil is. That's one thing to think of, too. You know, the soil can be very compacted or it can be very loose. Loose soil moves quicker. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when you're trying to dig down to uh, bedrock, uh, you know, when you're getting uh, depths of 10, 12 feet, uh, then you have a safety concern. You have to work in your area. So then it, it can take years. So we have we have had three seasons of active in, uh, excavation and there are areas where we're still digging down where we started three years ago. Wow. Are you always going to be with the shallow digs, or are you going to uh, jump around to some other places in your life? Well, you know, it all depends on, on the ability, the time I've got, the finances I have to yeah. go, uh, and the opportunities. Uh, I really like the the group that sponsors the uh, shallow dig, ABR. Uh, I really like those folks, so I'll stay with them. Now, in reality, the way it works is, you know, we are committed to five years of excavation at Shiloh as a team. Mm -hmm. Now, that may turn into 10, it may turn into 20, uh, but at some point we may do another site, and certainly at some point, uh, you know, uh, I I would like to excavate other sites, you know, other than Shiloh, uh, just for the experience. Mm -hmm. Where's one place that you want to go? Is there one part of the world that you want to go more than others? Well, I I would prefer to continue to dig probably in Israel. I would love to dig in Egypt. Uh, yeah. And in Egypt, it's a little different. Uh, they don't take volunteers like I've been describing. You hmm. have to, you have to, uh, you have to pay the local workers. So it's a lot more expensive to dig. Yeah. Uh, and so for a team like ours to get a license to dig in Egypt, that's a whole big financial question because of that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if I'll get that opportunity. I hope I would, but I would like to get an opportunity to dig in other sites in Israel because part of it is, you know, the the process of learning how to dig properly. That can translate anywhere, but understanding the finds and what you're looking at Mm -hmm. is going to be very different on a Mayan site in Central America than it is going to be on a site in Israel. Yeah. So it's kind of once you kind of get a a knowledge of of the material you're looking at, you know, uh, it's kind of uh, nice to to stay in an area where you understand what's coming out of the ground. So now what I would like to do, I would love if I could be involved some man in a dig in Jerusalem. You know, somewhere yeah. like that. Anywhere that the famous names, you know, anybody yeah. wants, you know, yeah. you know, uh, but uh, so that would be exciting and, and, and maybe someday. That would be really cool. I've always, well, of course, I, I'd want to go to the mines. That's really the uh, culture that first got me in to uh, archaeology and just ancient culture in general was the Mayans and how mysterious they were. Yes. That's what got me hooked onto them is just the unanswered questions. And really, with all of these ancient cultures, there's so many unanswered questions. And that's why it's so fascinating because. 
I would like to hope that one day we have it all figured out. We discover everything and we know, but that's not going to be the case. And we're just going to keep going and going. Uh, of course, Gobekli Tepe would always be good, but the pyramids is, if I don't ever get to go there and do anything fancy like y'all do, just to see them yeah. would be, yeah. it would be mind blowing. I have friends that have went and they yeah. just, and they say it's like you're, it's it's like you're looking at a picture. It don't even seem real that somebody. What what was it about four thousand years ago? About forty five, forty six hundred, I think, off the top of my head. Yeah, for, yeah. For the for the pyramids at Giza. Yeah, and yeah. somebody that long ago with human hands, no mm-hmm. mechanics whatsoever, yeah. was able to build something like that. It's it's amazing. You mean it wasn't aliens? That's, <laughs> don't get know, me started down that <laughs> rabbit hole. I, the, it, uh, well. well what do you what do you think it was? I don't think that it was aliens. I I, I know it wasn't aliens, but really, I mean, what could they do? Because some of those stones come from what what was it? I think a five hundred mm-hmm. miles away, something it, like that. It's well, crazy. It, you know, in reality, uh, uh, it, to be fair, we don't know. We don't know exactly how they built the pyramids. But what we can say uh, in the last twenty years, one of the the most amazing discoveries related to pyramid science, if we want to use that term, mm-hmm. uh, is the the graves of the pyramid builders there in Giza. And so it, it is very clear that the pyramids were built uh, not by slaves, uh, not by aliens. It was the local yeah. Egyptian uh, and Egyptian workers. We find their graffiti in the pyramids. Uh, the, the mystery, though, is how they did it. Uh, in you have to have an amazingly motivated society. Yeah. And it probably has to do with the belief of Pharaoh as, as deity or God and the importance of Pharaoh in the afterlife, you know, is probably what this great motivation comes from. Uh, and so they're, they're uh, amazing, obviously, probably the most famous uh items left to us from ancient history. And I will tell you, if you've never been, it's worth a visit. Uh, yeah, so I'd I've been once. Go. And I've been in the Great Pyramid, uh, and the only way I'd describe standing next to the Great Pyramid is like standing next to a stone mountain. That yeah. made sense to me, being from eastern Kentucky. It was like standing next to a stone mountain. Yeah, it's it's, it's really it's really that big. I mean, people yep. think like, oh, it's probably the size of the Pikeville parking garage or something like that. Yeah. No, it is massive. Did you ever go into any of the tombs or anything while you were there? Uh, I like to tell people my claim to fame from Egypt is I have been in King Tut's tomb alone with King Tut's mummy. Uh, which is not near the reality is not near as impressive as it sounds. <laughs> the uh, uh, when you go to the Valley of the Kings, you get a ticket to see three of the tombs, uh, but you don't get to see Tut's tomb. And uh, our tour guide, I was there on tour in 2007, basically said it costs fifty dollars extra. Don't pay it if you've seen a picture. You've seen it. It's small, and mm-hmm. that's true. Uh, it's maybe twice the size of the room we're sitting in. It's yeah. the actual tomb area. It's very small. And I said, you know what, I'll probably never be in Egypt again. I'm, if I walk in and turn around, I'm going to say I was in touch to him. So I paid my 50 bucks. And apparently all the tour guides tell everybody the same thing, because I walk in, and the guy guarding the place and me are the only people in there. Wow. And, and he doesn't speak a word of English, and he shows me around, and I'll never forget. He, he puts his arm around me and walks me over, stands me uh, over top of the sarcophagus. At this point, one of the goldest, golden sarcophagus uh, and Tut's mummy is still in the tomb. Now, they've moved them since. But when I was there, they were still in the tomb. And I'll never forget as long as I live, he puts his arm around me, looks me in the eye, and winks, and he leaves. So he leaves me alone in King Tut's tomb with just King Tut. And so, no, obviously, I couldn't hurt anything. Yeah. Uh, but it was an amazing experience. You know, this the goosebump kind of, wow, here's where I am in the world. Then when I walked out... Uh, I looked at him, and he smiled, and I smiled back, and I slipped him a 20 because I realized mm-hmm. what it was about. The yeah. word is bakshish. It's a tip. Oh. <laughs> so, but it was worth every bit of yeah, it. Yeah, man. You know? I, so, I, I, I would have slipped him another 50. I mean, that is. Yeah. Did, did, so were you able to touch it or even no, get that gosh, close? No, gosh, no. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no. I would almost been scared. I mean, because well, yeah, the, the yeah. curse and, and all that a, from back in the day, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Was, hey, that was a pretty yeah. creepy yeah. ordeal. Yep. Yeah. I would, uh, out of respect, I would not have touched anything. And I couldn't have because yeah. the, 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 they had it covered in glass. Oh, okay. Uh, but, you know, the, the mummy's curse is always a, a, a fun topic of conversation with uh, the, the stuff from Egypt. And uh, there were several uh, deaths that were easily explained, but it made for good press. Oh, yeah, a lot of good <laughs> really press. Really good press. And there was a curse. So Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. it's— Which was typical of any tomb. 
Yeah, it, it's it's such a fascinating culture though because it's still so mysterious. The the, the Bible. That's why we are uh, able to go to some well, go to some of the sites like Shiloh and stuff like that and really mm-hmm. know what we're looking at. And we have the text. But whenever you have cultures like Egypt or the Incas or yep. the Mayans, and the, the list goes on, you just it's really a guessing game. It, ain't it the Incas that didn't have a written language? I think that's right. Yeah. No, that's so uh, so I mean, yeah. like, uh, what what's the uh, uh, Machu Picchu? Mm-hmm. They have no idea. Yeah. yeah. What? Well, th- they know like when it was made. I think it was like it was around fifteen yep. hundred yep. something like that. But yeah, just it was built for like a hundred years and then abandoned. Yep. I have no idea. I love history because it's just one big guessing game. And, and that's true. And a lot of people we we hear experts speak on television and, and, and on different different venues, uh, especially from an archaeological perspective. Uh, and we take things presented as absolute fact, uh, when in reality, uh, most of our, our knowledge of the ancient world is really our best educated guess. Mm-hmm. And there are so many good examples of situations that 100 years ago our educated guests is we realized was wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, and so that's the neat thing, you know. It's just, I, I, as an attorney by trade, uh, I always say, you know, I like to hear that, but don't just give me your, this is it. Give me yeah. the evidence that backs it up. Exactly. Why did we come to that conclusion? And in reality, is it a good conclusion? Is it, it foundational? Or is it on flimsy ground here, you know, so. Yeah, it, it seemed to be when, like, at the beginning of the 1900s, at least, that was uh, unfortunately the case with a lot of archaeologic archaeolog- archaeologists. <laughs> Y'all. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if it didn't fit their narrative, then they dismissed the evidence. I, I've read quite a few stories where that's the case, and it's unfortunate because now, I mean, we could have put ourselves way off track isn't that the case with the sphinx like we're better at dating stuff now and they think that uh, they might not have had water erosion figured out so the sphinx may be older than we thought yeah and so there's different areas of thought there and it's a good example of you know anything in science uh and we're talking about archaeology specifically we should be able to incorporate new evidence and that new evidence will either support or change previous theory. And sometimes it's, it's human nature. We tend to want to hang on to what we've been taught yeah. as fact. Uh, and so, you know, in some of these situations, uh, that's what happened. The certain theories would be rejected because it didn't meet uh, with the, this is the way it's always been. Uh, mm-hmm. And this is what I was taught when I was in school 50 years ago. You know, yeah. and uh, uh, I think to truly be a good archaeologist, we have to make our best educated determination with the information at hand and be willing to honestly reassess it mm-hmm. uh, when new information becomes available. And, you know, often that new information will will not change. More often than not, it will actually support and make stronger the previous mm-hmm. uh, uh, educated guess, we'll say, but where it maybe gives a different view we need to be willing to say let's back up and start over yeah you know? see that's why Gebekli Tepe excited me so much and it is, it's it's such a new side I think it was it was the 90s right when they discovered Gebekli Tepe I can't remember but it's very recent very recent yep. and I mean that site just rewrites everything mm-hmm. I, I, I it's like 10,000 years plus at yep. this point right now. Something it, like that. Yeah, and this is the time where we were still supposed to be hunter-gatherers. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we didn't even know, well, supposedly, didn't even know how to plant stuff back yeah. then. Yet, they were able to build a... Fa- and Gebekli Tepe, it's, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's yep. a huge site that was built with bare hands. So, I mean, that, I, I love that, and it's so fascinating. Yeah. Well, for me, that that's a good example. We tend to make assumptions about ancient man not being very smart. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have the uh, the caveman type, you know, but the reality is the human brain's pretty fascinating thing. And uh, while ancient man may not have had our technologies, uh, 
he had the ability to work with what was available to him and do some amazing things. Yeah, just like the pyramids. I mean, it still blows my mind how supposedly some of the stones that were used in the building come from 500 miles away. Now, that's where the talk about aliens come yes. in. But I've seen, also seen theories about like they somehow wetted the sand. Maybe that worked or yeah. something like that. If they ever make a time travel machine, man, I am going to be traveling to quite a few places. Yeah. So... Uh, for the people that want to check out the world of Jesus and everything that y'all have to offer, go get tickets and maybe even uh, be a part of an archaeological dig. How did they go about that process? All right. Well, uh, as far as checking out the world of Jesus here locally in Pikeville, Kentucky, uh, they can do that at the Appalachian Center for the Arts. Now, if you don't know what that is, uh, it was formerly the Jenny Wiley Theater in downtown Pikeville. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, currently... Uh, you can just walk in any weekday from 2 to 5, and they'll have uh, the exhibit open for anybody that wants to walk in. Uh, you can also make appointments. You know, we see lots of groups, whether it's church groups, school groups, or even just a family that says, hey, wait, that'd be fun. Let's go do that. You can make an appointment to see it effectively any weeknight or on the weekend. We just got to make sure that uh, somebody at the facility can be there. And if you want a tour guide, you have one option. That's me. And then I can be available. Uh <laughs> And so uh, they would uh, find that on the apparts.org is the website. Uh, they can call the app, and you're going to have to forgive me because I don't remember the phone number off the top of my head. Uh, uh, people got Google. They're they've okay. got Google. They can find that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know that we've turned down an appointment yet. So, uh, you know, if it's a situation that they can't come during the hours, uh, they can do it. Now, what I do tell people, especially if they want a group, an mm -hmm. appointment is you said, well, we've got to September and that's true. Well, this is my second exhibit. And what I tell folks is, you know, you don't have to be in a hurry, but don't wait to the end. Mm -hmm. I do remember having to turn a couple groups away because we couldn't fit them in yeah. uh, when the last one was closing because people's human nature, we tend to wait to the last minute. So if it's something they're interested with their group, probably a good idea to go ahead and get it booked. Yeah, this is such a fascinating thing. I mean, whether you're a person of faith or not, even if you're just a history buff, exactly. this is really cool. And also, I forgot to uh, bring this up earlier. You also have a gift shop That's as right. well for people that uh, may want a part of history. That's right. Uh, we do. Uh, my my thing has always been if you come uh, to our exhibit, we want to at least give you the opportunity to learn more. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, a small bookshop in that gift shop where if you're interested in biblical archaeology, you can purchase a from a, a good collection of books, good sources to learn more about that. Uh, but we also have gift, gift type items. Uh, some of our most popular are the... Uh, I say necklaces. My wife told me not to say that. Say necklace charms or something. I don't know because we don't actually do the, the, the necklace. We do the little charm oh. that hangs on the necklace. And we have ancient coins uh, in one is one of the most popular. And the coins are a Jewish coin uh, from Alexander Janaeus. No one's probably ever heard that name. But here's the reason it's important. It is the same style of coin that historians believe that a little old lady referenced by Jesus in the biblical text who comes to the temple and gives two mites. Mm -hmm. These are the type of coins they believe those to be. Uh, and so they're the real mm. thing. And you can wear a little piece of biblical or ancient history. But one of my favorites are actually the glass. We sell Roman glass pieces uh, that are, are broken pieces of 2,000 year old. A lot of people don't even know glass goes that far back. Uh, but the thing about them is the color. Uh, a lot of the glass, whether it's from the patina in the ground or the original color, we get beautiful greens, blues, mm -hmm. yellows. Uh, and, and so it becomes not just a, a, a piece of nice jewelry. It is a story you can tell. Oh, what's mm -hmm. that? Well, let me tell you, this is a 2,000 year old piece of of glass of uh, that came from a vessel from ancient Israel. And so those are really neat items. It's so, a great conversation starter. You better believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tommy, buddy, it is a very fascinating exhibit that you have up there. I encourage everybody to check it out and hopefully to see you out on a dig one day. That'd be exciting. That's right. And so, like I said, if they're interested in that dig, digshallow.org, or they can contact me at the University of Pikeville. So, Tommy, thanks for everything, buddy. My pleasure to be here. See you next week, folks. Boom. All right. All right.